Veda is a term from ancient Sanskrit. As we know, it means knowledge. And it's about knowledge of reality, knowledge of life, ultimate knowledge. That knowledge in Veda has not been obtained through the usual means of obtaining knowledge uh, of the laws of nature, which we have through uh, experimentation and scientific analysis and study and intellectual considerations of how the world works. It's a knowledge that has been totally obtained from introspection. One can say uh, many of our scientific findings uh, ultimately also start with thought, analysis, uh, theory, and then prove them into the physical world. Of course, we have the uh, rationalist, the different philosophies of understanding, idealism, monism, psych panpsychism, different understandings and theories that have come from intellectual analysis. And uh, depending on our internal logic, we have a um, vision of the universe and in modern science, recent time, uh, it has to be proven through scientific inquiry uh, into the laws of nature and in physics we know going deeper into the different layers of the classical quantum mechanical quantum field theory and even uh, more unified theories that will be discussed during this day I'm sure by the great scientists available. Uh, in that ancient time it was thought in the Vedic time, and it's still a part of the Vedic tradition, that the reality of life is not based on matter, that matter is only an expression of something more profound. And many philosophers have throughout time tried to see what could be that essential nature of reality where things come from. And as we know through Greeks and different philosophers of the Middle East and the Far East and thinkers even in Western life, <clears throat> been looking at originally something that is a substance that can be material in some level. Some were thinking it's the air, others the fire, others the water. And more and more modern times, it's energy. So we have matter is made out of energy. It's not out of uh, physical atoms that are indivisible, but of fields. And in the ancient knowledge of reality that has come from the Veda, it is consciousness. So consciousness is non-material. It is beyond the, what we call matter. And if we want to resemble it to anything we know today, we would say that they had postulated that the consciousness is the unified field, is the source of everything. So consciousness is that substance, if you like, which is non-substance, it's energy. Uh, it's not energy in terms of physical, but it's kind of a field a unified field that itself becomes what we see as the universe. This reality is not far from even the thinking of many modern great thinkers and even physicists and scientists. And they have different names to it, panpsychism or monism, which means Reality is not dual, it's not dualism of matter and um, the mental value, the consciousness value. It is that actually, literally, everything is consciousness. Everything is really only an expression of consciousness. And Veda postulates that. 
and also expresses how consciousness appears as matter from its own inner interaction, the dynamics within it. So you have one pure consciousness that is like an ocean, flat, absolute, that has within it the ability to look at itself. Because it is consciousness, it can experience itself. And therefore, there is a reflective self-curving onto itself process by which it sees itself from a conscious perspective. And here we differentiate consciousness as a reality of flat being with to be conscious, which is a process by which consciousness experiences itself and therefore generates three values within that process of self-experience. The three values are the three components of all that we call conscious, to be conscious. To be conscious means there is a knower, a subject, who is experiencing something, experiencing an object, through a process of experiencing something that links the subject to the object. This emergence of three values within the unity of one consciousness, so we're saying monism, so only one reality, we're not changing our mind, yet that one reality has a nature, has a quality, and that quality is to be conscious. And by being conscious, three flavors emerge, the flavor of I am the observer, I am the observed, and I am the process of observation. Because there are these three flavors, there are three qualities within consciousness. And this was revealed by Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, the founder of the Transcendental Meditation Program in the West, which has shown that the Vedic literature itself is based on these three values. They call them the Rishi, the seer, the knower, the Devata, the process of knowing, and Chandas, which he explained as the object of experience, the manifest value. So there is the silent observer, the dynamic process, and the object which overtakes the seer, which overtakes the awareness of the actual seer and the process and becomes what we experience as a reality that the observer observes. Think of when you observe anything, you observe a flower, you look at the flower, you know you are yourself, but then you project your attention on a flower and then the object, the flower overtakes the consciousness. So it has that hiding quality where uh, you forget that you are yourself. It's not the moment to think of yourself. Your consciousness is overtaken by the object of experience, which is the flower. So you have now the object. These qualities interacting with each other uh, with different percentages of silence of the observer, dynamism of the process and the hiding quality of the object lead to a cascade of unmanifest possibilities that emerge through the process of consciousness looking at itself. So consciousness being conscious to become conscious. But therefore there is an infinite possibility that emerges of ways of looking and seeing and experiencing and ways and objects of experience which is first unmanifest because it's all conceptual and the concepts of the uh, consciousness experiencing itself. It's like a fictional writer who experiences uh, in their mind different potential people, different potential creatures, different potential things that can exist, things cannot exist you know, all kinds of imagination. And therefore they are unmanifest. They are on the level of pure, you can even say imagination. 
but these are flavors of different ways of being. And these unmanifest ways of being ultimately become experienced and expressed in the universe through a process that we uh, don't need to explain, but that I go through in the book, One Unbounded Ocean of Consciousness, to show how possible it is that this uh, unmanifest infinite possibilities can start looking as being manifest realities. Now, Veda has a structure in itself because the process of elaborating on itself and looking at itself is very structured. And from it emerged the sense of distinctiveness, which means the sense of ego, the sense of individuality, because the observer can say, I am different than the object, and my flavor is a flavor of an observer. So I identify myself as an observer. I could identify myself as an object of observation, but therefore there are these two flavors. Each of those can have an individuality, and therefore all the infinite number of possibilities that emerge and the self-reflective, self-conscious, uh, being conscious, curving on itself process lead to an infinite number of potential subjects, objects, processes. And since consciousness is, of course, conscious, it is also conscious that they are different. And therefore, in this, it sees ego, individuality, and the intellect arises as a faculty of comparing similarities and differences. That's what the intellect does. So there is an original initial self, initial small self, initial big self, the perfect one unbounded field of being. And there is these small selves that arise, the egos of individual perception. And there is the intellect which differentiates between. So this is how the faculty of intellect emerges and the faculty of mind which can float around and see all of these values without necessarily examining their differences and that's what we call our mind which jumps around from thought to thought on the surface level of consideration so this process by which uh, these values emerge is structured and it leads to uh, all the values that emerge as fluctuations within the unmanifest consciousness. The Vedic literature, as explained by Maharshi Mahesh Yogi, is actually a direct experience of the dynamics that happen in the process of the emergence of multiplicity from unity. And that process is a dynamic process, even though it is unmanifest at the beginning, it's just imagination, if you like, but in an orderly fashion. And it is possible, because we are all consciousness, to directly go to that consciousness also, to directly go to that original state of pure awareness, the original state of pure consciousness. And those who practice transcendental meditation throughout the time that Marshi has taught it in the West and throughout the history of time, all those who practice this technique can experience transcendence, which means going beyond the surface value and back to the original pure consciousness, pure awareness, the source of everything and everyone. And in their deep introspection, in their deep transcendence, they could actually see not only the flat consciousness, but the dynamics of the process of manifestation, which means the dynamics of how one becomes many. I am one, I can be many. That is also an expression in the Vedic literature, in the Vedic tradition. And they see those reverberations, vibrations of consciousness. And that's what they chant. So when we say, what is the Vedic literature? The Vedic literature is the expression of the dynamics of one consciousness becoming many. And it does it on the basis of these three values, 
observer process of observation and observe. And then there is all the analysis about it, the ego, the intellect, the mind, and other values that come in that create this differentiation. And when we look at the structure of the Vedic literature, we take, for example, Rig Veda and how it is constructed, which means even its uh, syllables, how they are built, its uh, divisions into different lines, which they call richas, uh, different padas, different parts of the richas, and how they are collected into groups of uh, suktas, meaning like paragraphs, and then mandalas, which means like volumes, and then the whole books of that, we find that they are actually in tune with basic constructs of very, very rigid logic and strict uh, uh, sequence. And what is very interesting, as you go through the whole Vedic literature, which is not just Rig Veda, but of course, Sama Veda, Yajur Veda, Atharva Veda, as Maharishi constructed them, we find 40 aspects of the Veda that Maharishi brought to light in different aspects of their structure. The actual structure, meaning how many paragraphs, how many words, how many books, and also their uh, function. Why this is this? What does this do? This one is expressing, this one is distinguishing and deciding. This one is uh, unifying, this one is enumerating, and these qualities of them. And Marishi asked me to look at the human physiology as a physical aspect of our reality, which is uh, de declared by many sages and uh, prophets and teachers to be made in the image of God or to be made, the humans are made in the image of God, the, you know, the uh, kingdom of heaven within you, in the Tao, you are the Tao, in the Buddhist tradition also we can find these values in Islam and in, in Christianity, Judaism, when you look deep, you find that there are these indications that humans are made in the image of those values of the highest possible value. And I had the uh, honor to be guided by Marishi to actually look into that. And I have discovered an interesting reality, which is that the divisions and the subdivisions of our body, our physical structure as discovered by modern science, our nervous system, in particular, our brain, our different nerves and different functions, they are an exact replica of the dynamics of Veda and Vedic literature in terms of structure and function. And this was done in, nine, in the early 1990s, in 1992, 93. And the book came at that time, Veda and Vedic Literature and Human Physiology, which declared that matter is consciousness. Physiology is intelligence, that we are simply the replica of natural law. And this is why we are able to experience transcendence. We are able to experience pure consciousness because within us, in our machine, our body, our nervous system is already built in the image of the dynamics of natural law available in this Vedic sound. So Veda is not just some philosophy or some beautiful poetry or uh, nice stories, which it has beautiful wisdom and stories, and it has very beautiful knowledge, knowledge of health, knowledge of orientation of homes, knowledge of our relation to the cosmos and the environment. It has a very profound knowledge on that level, but more importantly, more importantly is it is a replica of the dynamics of the laws of nature, which is the dynamics of consciousness that reflects itself on itself and leads to the manifestation of multiplicity from unity. So ultimately we are all the unified field. We are all that one unbounded ocean of consciousness. 
that is expressed in different ways uh, to different individuals, but it is itself that expresses itself in the universe and the planets and the stars and our plants and animals and humans and the environment. So there is that oneness at the basis of that wholeness and humans have the ability to experience that supreme oneness because they are uh, made in the image of that they have the dynamics already within them and when the physiology is in tune with that it can experience enlightenment it can experience transcendence which the veda is all about in terms of its meaning for example enlightenment higher states of consciousness that we can achieve not just sleep dream and waking but also transcending so experiencing pure consciousness and establishing that pure consciousness in our daily activity so that we have ultimately a new state of consciousness where we are never forgetting who we are so when we look at the flower it's no more the flower overshadowing my being I am there all the time. I feel myself, I know myself to be pure consciousness, yet I can experience all the differences on the surface value. And we call this cosmic consciousness. Ultimately, consciousness rises from cosmic consciousness to glorified cosmic consciousness to ultimately unity consciousness. When I know that I am the unified field, not just intellectually, I know that I am consciousness, but even on an experiential level. When I look at an object, I know the object is also myself in essence. I'm not, of course, a flower. I have a much more dynamics of natural law than the flower. Uh, but still, the flower is made of that unified field, which we know today to be a physical uh, contemplation of the ultimate reality and mathematical uh, analysis is guiding to this. And, and as we will hear, maybe super string theory, etc. But I know it not only intellectually, I know it experientially. So when I look at anything, when I feel anything, when I experience anything, it's all from that platform of oneness of being. This is not just a knowledge of intellectual value, which it has and wisdom. Uh, it is a knowledge that has practical technologies. Practical technologies to actually achieve this higher state of consciousness. And that is through transcendental meditation, which is the supreme level of yoga. The highest value of yoga is the unity, mind, body, and environment, one wholeness, one unbounded pure consciousness. That is the higher states of consciousness. And that can be experienced through transcendental meditation. You go back to yourself and dive within in a very simple, easy, natural way which even children can do morning and evening. And many who are with us have already had uh, the experience. If not, they are actually the teachers and uh, many are not. So we invite them to try this because it's not only a fulfilling experience on the intellectual level, on the feeling level, on the sense of self expanding from the small self to the big self, but it's accompanied by the reorganization of the physiology back to its essential original structure, which is the structure of Veda. And what this does is removes the stresses and strains, which are foreign material in our body. And therefore, we realign ourselves with, as, with our original supreme design. And therefore, it's like a machine that's supposed to work perfectly, but it has problems and kinks here and there. And this is what we call stress. And when you remove those, it now functions well. And what does it do? It gives us happiness. It gives us a sense of fulfillment and the physiology is more healthy. And that's what the scientific research has shown that all the physiology realigns, becomes healthy. Uh, and we see this not just uh, talking about it on 
uh, level of imagination of goodwill and good wishes, but actually uh, scientific experiments, more than 600 scientific research studies and uh, most of them peer reviewed in the best uh, journals of science in the world have shown improved health, decreased heart attack, decreased uh, blood pressure problems, decreased anxiety, improvement in sleep, uh, better performance, better activity in life, and uh, improved behavior, and also changes in society. Because consciousness is permeating, consciousness is all there is, when we enliven the consciousness within ourselves, and when there is a small number of people who do it in society, then you have the enlivenment of what we call the collective consciousness of society. And we have proven this repeatedly. When a certain percentage of people practice this technique, then the society improves. The society itself has less accidents, less crime, uh, improvement in relationship with other countries, less conflict, and uh, development of all good things, prosperity and wellness in society. So Veda is a science, a total science of life, because it is a science of consciousness, and because consciousness is primary, and consciousness ultimately is all that there is, and consciousness manifests in the universe, in different multiplicity, it manifests within us as individual in its fullness and gives us the ability to uh, experience that reality directly through introspection and verify that when we do that subjectively, we have objectively the analysis of the changes on the personal level and on the social level that guide us all to understand really from the objective and subjective level that consciousness is most important. Anyway, of course, even on the surface level, what is life without consciousness? If you didn't have consciousness, you would not be able, of course, to participate and listen and understand and think and contemplate. We cannot discover laws of nature. We cannot experience feelings, love, happiness, growth, development. We cannot make sense of anything because we are nothing. If you are not conscious, you imagine in anesthesia or in coma, one is not conscious. What is there? There is nothing. So there is nothingness without consciousness. And with consciousness, we can have everythingness and wholeness, totality is open for every individual and for society. So congratulations on this uh, grand uh, symposium or discussion uh, on the values of Veda science and consciousness. I took my time, but if there is one question, maybe I can uh, and, you know, entertain it if that's, uh, that's permitted. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Nader, for this extremely fascinating presentation, very comprehensive, not just the insight into consciousness and what consciousness is, but how consciousness really is everything and creates everything that is, appears as everything that is. This brings up some questions in the chat. One question is, where do you place behavior, human values, and cultures that have been growing for thousands of years in your concept of consciousness? And does consciousness belong to the whole society or only to a few, like is written in the Vedas? Thank you in advance from Angelika Krause. Higher consciousness belongs only to those enlightened. So unity consciousness is only available to those who actually go through the process of transcending and grow in that. But consciousness is all there is. Consciousness is uh, the source of everything. And when we say that, one can wonder, OK, what do you mean? How can a stone be conscious, for example, if it is consciousness? We look at that as a very limited 
ability to experience, not to think, because there is no thinking in the stone, no analysis. And consciousness has a range from unity value to small, small values. Small values means when a stone experiences gravity and that's, they respond to gravity, we are going, going to call this a very tiny, meager, small level of consciousness. It is nothing, absolutely nothing to compare with human consciousness because the stone doesn't have a sense of self, the stone doesn't think, doesn't analyze, doesn't have an intellect as we do, doesn't uh, say, oh, I'm going to fall and break myself or anything. It just detects gravity and without making a decision or even the ability to make a decision about it, it falls. So we're calling this a tiny level of consciousness. As you go through the uh, trees, uh, they have more consciousness, the animals have more consciousness, the human have more consciousness. And as you develop your value of enlightenment, you can experience pure consciousness. Now, this question of yours is very profound and I answer it in the book, One Unbounded Ocean of Consciousness. Uh, and that really relates to freedom and determinism, law and order and uh, you know, randomness and chaos, because these are very big questions that also come in the context of when there is one consciousness that is unmanifest, then what happens is in the manifest creation, it allows freedom to even the smallest particles. Now, they're not free as we are because they're not conscious as we are, but they have randomness at that level. That freedom is called randomness. Randomness and probability happens. So things get together. They start creating elementary particles, molecules, you know, atoms, molecules, cells, etc., and whatever is in the universe. And they combine to create humans and societies, and the humans and societies create values and traditions. And all of these can be haphazardous, can be uh, chaotic, but they can also be orderly. And orderly means in tune with rising towards unity consciousness. And in that sense, we can see that there are values that are higher, there are values that are lower uh, in terms of um, even uh, perception, in terms of individual life and social life and relationship with others that achieve higher ability to reach the so top level of pure being or lower level of ability. And this goes back and forth and there is an adjustment. So there is trial and error. So there is freedom, but there is a design behind it, which means if you follow the road, you get to the goal, but you're free also to try to kind of go around and expect and interpret and and move right and left and even move back and forth, but you ultimately can reach the goal also. And there's perhaps one final question that we attempted to still add from Manuela Wagner, who says, with transcendental meditation, I transcend the object. How do I reverse the process of manifestation of the objects? The objects remain manifest um, and they come from that consciousness. And I just experience them as one of those different aspects of the infinite multiplicity of potentialities in creation and manifestation. But it's on which platform I experience it, either I become the object because my consciousness is limited, so the object hides me, or I am awake within myself, fully awake in my pure being, which means I know that consciousness is all there is and that I am that. And at the same time, I experience the individualities of objects. And actually, as I grow in my consciousness, I even individ experience the actual essence of the object in, in pure consciousness, yet appearing as many and showing these many values. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Nader. You have laid a basis for this whole conference. I'm sure many of the following speakers will want to follow up and discuss points that you have raised. So a big thank you from our side. Thank you for organizing. Have a great conference.